Hello and welcome to another lecture for my class, PSYC 212, Psychological Aspects of Drug Use and Abuse. It's been a busy semester here in fall of 2017. Um, I've added some lectures, I've updated some of the lectures in my playlist. There's a lot of material for you uh, to watch about drugs and drug use and treatments for drug use problems. Uh, my goal in today's lecture, as you can guess from the title I'm sure, is to provide a little bit of a review or kind of a, a recapitulation of some of the important points that I've tried to make throughout this semester. I think way back in my first lecture, I introduced this idea of thinking about drugs, the challenge to think about all the different ways that drugs play a role in our lives, in society, some of the benefits of drugs, some of the problems associated with drugs, and so on. Uh, in this lecture today, I want to return to that idea of thinking about drugs, and specifically want to think about the role that drugs have played in the history of people, um, how drugs work by influencing the nervous system, the different types of variables or factors which influence how variable the experiences of drugs are. Um, think about some of the ways that drugs can be addictive or habit forming for people. And also think about some of the uh, ways that we can treat drug use problems some, and some of the challenges associated with treating drug use problems. So okay, let's do some thinking about drugs. A point that I've tried to make throughout the semester is that drugs are part of human culture and human history. Going back as, about as far as we can in archaeological records, we find evidence of people using drugs. And well up through today, it's pretty much impossible to find a society or a group of people pretty much anywhere on the planet that has no access to drugs or no tradition of using certain types of drugs. Now, of course, people at different times in different places use drugs for different reasons, and we could spend a lot of time trying to tease apart all the different reasons that people use drugs. Um, I've tried to just keep it simple and identify three broad areas uh, or three broad uh, reasons for using drugs. People at different times have used drugs for religious or ceremonial purposes, they've used drugs for medicinal purposes, and they've used drugs for recreational purposes. Now, this may seem pretty obvious, uh, but I, I make this distinction or I, I sort of raise it because I think it's easy to sometimes think of drugs and just focus on recreational drugs or drugs which are maybe even recreational drugs and illegal drugs which people abuse. Um, the picture is more complicated and even any one drug throughout history has been used, uh, can, we can find evidence that any one drug has probably been used for multiple different reasons. So for example, you might think of a drug like nicotine and tobacco. Um, historically, it was used for religious and ceremonial purposes uh, by folks who were indigenous to the Americas. Later on, it was used for medicinal purposes by uh, Europeans and by other folks. And of course, nowadays it's used uh, by many people recreationally in various forms like cigarettes or e-cigarettes or cigars or chewing tobacco and so on. So same drug, many different uses across peoples and across time. And that's just one example, but we could probably find other examples that fit that picture as well. That may be obvious as well, but there are benefits to using drugs. You know, throughout history and across time and place and peoples, we can find evidence that drugs have been used for religious inspiration. Drugs play a role in many religious traditions, uh, whether it's sacramental wine or sacramental use of cannabis, use of psychedelic uh, mushrooms or fungi and so on. Plenty of examples of people using uh, drugs to expand their minds or to make themselves more susceptible to religious contemplation. Um, obviously many drugs have and are used for treatments of illnesses or to alleviate suffering. Um, there are plenty of drugs which are used for entertainment because it can be fun to use them. Drugs are used, some drugs are used for relaxation because it's soothing or calming to use them. And many drugs are used to socialize. You know, it's, uh, although there are some people who use drugs by themselves, many people, probably even most people, when they use drugs are using drugs with other folks. Um, suggesting that socializing or the, uh, is an important thing for people who are using drugs or that drugs in some way are an important adjunct or accompaniment to socializing for many people. Now because drugs have so many benefits, at least in potential, um, 
many people want them, and that's been the case throughout history. And because, the, uh, or any time you have something that people really want a lot of, there's a lot of money to be made in controlling the supply of that thing. And if we go back through history, we can see many examples of times and places in which the control of a particular drug, whether it was coffee, or tea, or tobacco, or opium, or even drugs like cocaine or heroin has yielded tremendous wealth for those people or those countries who can control that supply. Um, the desire to control, uh, to, to discover and control trade routes for drugs was a big part of the push for European colonization of the Americas and other parts of the world. It played a huge role in the slave trade. It, played a huge role in many wars. Wars were fought, literal wars were fought over control of drugs, you know, most notably the opium wars. But think of other examples. Um, even our modern day notion of the war on drugs can be seen through the lens of economics. It's largely a war over who gets to control the supply of drugs like heroin or cocaine in our country and other countries as well. So people want drugs. Anytime people want something, there's money to be made and people will fight over who gets to make that money. Now, of course, drugs aren't all good, or at least not always all good. Uh, there are all sorts of costs or, or negative consequences that can be associated with drugs, and I don't want to in any way um, understate these or sort of glide over them. Um, we could describe in, in very fine detail all the different types of problems that can occur with all the different types of drugs, but if we want to think in sort of more general or abstract terms, we can say, well, there are three broad considerations that come up when we think about the risks or the costs or the problems associated with using drugs. There's toxicity, that is the risk that a particular drug or a certain way of using a drug can pose to the health of a user. You know, will, will it make you sick? Will it even injure or kill you? There's the risk uh, of addiction or dependence. You know, even a drug which isn't particularly toxic might nonetheless be sort of risky to use if you're likely to become addicted or dependent to it. And then there's this idea or this risk of social problems. Um, are, is the use of that drug associated with things that in general we don't like or that, that are difficult for society like increased aggression or increased injuries or accidents or uh, increased crime and so on. And these costs have been around uh, for many drugs for much of history and um, they have promoted or they've encouraged uh, different societies, different times and places and peoples to consider ways to regulate or control drug use. Now, the regulation of drug use by law is a relatively recent, historically speaking, a relatively recent idea. Throughout most of human history, there were few or essentially no laws about who could use which types of drugs. Um, it's only really in sort of the modern period of the 20th century and into the 21st century that in America and in other countries around the world, there's this idea of creating laws uh, to control which drugs people should be allowed to use. Um, however, throughout all of history, there have been times when people have tried to in some way encourage abstinence of drugs or discourage people from using drugs either through laws or through social persuasion. And it's historically speaking always been pretty difficult to discourage people from using drugs. Drugs have, at least for some people, huge benefits or they, they pose the possibility of huge benefits and it's pretty hard to get people to not use them. Uh, famous examples of drug prohibition um, include, of course, alcohol prohibition in the United States, uh, which although in some ways is successful um, enterprise and that it did, at least in the early years, reduce overall consumption of alcohol, produced a lot of unintended consequences like adulterated forms of illegal alcohol, um, increased organized crime, and so on. Um, those unintended consequences seem to occur almost any time we try to regulate uh, the, the use of drugs. And so, you know, alcohol prohibition in America is probably the most famous example. Other famous examples would include modern prohibitions against using drugs like cocaine or heroin. Um, they're even kind of fun or sort of fun, I suppose, historical examples like during times in which uh, there was heavy regulation and taxation on tea imports into Europe, especially into Britain, there were enormous problems with adulterated tea supplies or uh, organized crime around smuggling tea into the country. So anytime we try to regulate drug use, um, 
there are potential um, benefits to that. You know, we can discourage dangerous use of drugs. We maybe help people who have problems with drugs, but there are almost always unintended consequences. And that's really important to think about as we go forward and try and grapple with the drug problems that society continues to have and probably will always continue to have. I guess that kind of brings me to maybe my first important idea, at least from history, which is that we sometimes think of drugs as a modern problem. Um, maybe I'm wrong about this, or maybe I'm just projecting from my own experience, but I can remember growing up in the 1980s and the 1990s and sitting through many classes in, high, you know, in grade school and high school and even in college where uh, I was told about the risks of using drugs and the, the menace of drugs. And sometimes these, these classes presented drugs as a relatively recent phenomenon, or at least the problems associated with them as relatively recent phenomena. Um, I think that's not really the case. You know, societies have always had to deal with drugs because drugs have always been around in one form or another and people have always wanted to use them and at least some people have always had problems with them. Um, it's difficult for us to avoid problems with drugs. We've always had to kind of struggle with them and uh, not to sound too pessimistic but I suspect that will always be the case for human society. Another important idea that I think is worth making is that we sometimes think of drugs as either all good or all bad. Again, perhaps I'm kind of projecting from my own experiences in the past uh, as a younger person, especially as a student um, in public schools, but I remember getting the sense that drugs are just bad. Drugs are dangerous. You shouldn't do drugs. You should just say no to drugs. Now, it's undeniably true that some drugs can be quite dangerous at least when used in certain ways by certain people. Um, it's also true that there are some drugs that are probably on the whole pretty good to use, or at least pretty safe to use. Probably the best example of that would be caffeine, a drug which is not particularly dangerous to anyone, or at least for the most part, and has some modest benefits for most users. You know, just at this moment, I've had a strong cup of tea, and maybe you can even hear that in my slightly accelerated pace of speech. Um, but this idea of drugs is either good or bad is problematic. Drugs aren't really good or bad. They're both. Um, you know, there are ways in which drugs can be beneficial. There are ways in which drugs can be risky or dangerous. And people individually or groups of people in terms of societies and cultures have always had to struggle to decide or to achieve a balance between those benefits and those costs or between those uh, positive aspects and those risky or dangerous aspects. That's the way it's always been historically. And again, not to sound pessimistic about it, but I think that's probably the way it will always be. Um, um, thus, I would argue one of the, the benefits of taking a class like this, or at least learning about the history of drugs, is to have a kind of an, a, a real appreciation for how to think about drugs as you go into the future, either in your own individual life or as a voting member of our society. Yet another important idea that we learned from history, at least the history of drugs, is that prejudice has always shaped attitudes and laws about drugs. I mean, pretty much without exception, any drug that's ever been heavily regulated, whether it's been tobacco or whether it's been uh, you know, alcohol or cocaine or, um, or o opiates of various sorts, um, almost always we find evidence that the attitudes about drugs, whether they're dangerous or not dangerous, or whether they should be legal or illegal, are wrapped up in the society's attitudes about certain groups of people, whether they are immigrants, whether they are women, whether they're African Americans, whether they're Mexican Americans or Latinos. Um, it's a really sad, I think, uh, commentary on the way we think about members of our own society that we can use drugs as a way of uh, further punishing folks, you know, uh, finding ways or excuses to penalize or police people who we, in, in a broad sense, don't care for or don't think are responsible. Um, it's been argued by historians that societies have always found within themselves groups of people who are deemed responsible and able to take care of themselves, most frequently in American history, white people, especially white males, especially white males of modest or better economic means. And societies have always found groups within them who are deemed not worthy of their own responsible control and thus susceptible or requiring of governmental control. So whether it's prohibitions against women using alcohol, whether it's prohibitions against people smoking opium that apply to Chinese immigrants, but not to uh, you know, white people who consume opium in tinctures or medicines, 
whether it's laws against cocaine inspired by fear of, as you can see in this newspaper headline, um, Negro cocaine fiends, the new southern menace. Uh, even in modern times, some of our attitudes about which drugs should be illegal are bound up in attitudes, um, or our, our ideas, our laws about which drugs should be legal and which should be illegal are bound up in our attitudes about which types of people in society should be allowed to use drugs and which type of people should not. And I think that's absolutely important to think about. You know, one of the um, you know, news items that I've highlighted a couple times throughout the semester is the disparity in policing and sentencing for marijuana related crimes. Uh, if you compare in America using FBI crime statistics, white people and black people, you see year after year comparable rates of marijuana use. If you compare um, their rates of policing and incarceration, especially for uh, relatively modest crimes or you know, possession and whatnot, you see that black people are far more frequently targeted for policing and for prosecution for marijuana crimes than for white people. That is, you know, has to do with the unfortunate reality of racism in America. Um, hopefully, recognizing that racism, recognizing that prejudice can help change things. Um, in some cases it does and, and can and hopefully will, but we need to be aware of that. And I think that's a powerful lesson from history, the history of drugs. So moving on, if we think about drugs, we, of course, if you take a class like this, you're wondering, you know, how did drugs have the effect, uh, the effects that they have? You know, why is it the case that using alcohol makes you feel one way, using caffeine makes you feel another way, using nicotine makes you feel yet another way? Well, the story of drugs is, of course, complicated, but a big part of that story is that drugs have the effects that they have on how we think, how we feel, how we behave, in part because they influence our nervous system. And they influence our nervous system by altering what would otherwise be the normal functioning of various parts of our peripheral and central nervous system. Now, my lectures on the nervous system are, are fairly long, and I, I don't have the time or, frankly, the energy, even with caffeine, to go back through all of that. But let's just hit a few basic high points. You, you can look at aspects of the central nervous system. Here we see the hindbrain or the brainstem, and we can see that drugs, which influence the functioning of this part of the brain, this part of the central nervous system, will have some pretty predictable effects. If you take a drug like alcohol in high doses, you'll disrupt the normal functioning of the cerebellum, which is to coordinate voluntary motor movements. And thus, the reason why you slur your speech and you stumble in walking, or you feel real loose in dancing when you've had a few drinks, is because your cerebellum isn't doing what it normally does as well as it normally does it. Um, in extreme cases, if you take a very high amount of alcohol, or if you take a very high amount of opiates, or very high amount of certain types of sedatives, you can really shut down the normal functioning of the various structures in this part of the central nervous system to the point where you can lapse into a coma and even die. So a good, although of course rather tragic example of how dr a drug or different kinds of drugs actually can change <clears throat> the normal functioning of particular structures in the central nervous system and yield the consequences that we see from using alcohol or from using quaaludes or from using opiates and so on. Another part of the central nervous system that's important uh, are all the parts kind of in the midbrain to forebrain region that we call the limbic system. These are a set of structures in the central nervous system that have to do with things like emotions and memory. Drugs which influence the functioning of these different structures will have effects on things like emotions and memory and learning. Um, and so on. So, you know, to use my favorite drug example, alcohol, again, you know, if you take enough alcohol, uh, alcohol will tend to disrupt the normal functioning of the hippocampus. The normal functioning of that structure it has to do with the formation of long-term memories. So, um, if you ever wonder why is it the case that after having a few drinks, I have a little bit harder time remembering what I've been up to in a particular evening, or if I drink an awful lot, I could have a full-on blackout. Well, the reason for that is that alcohol is disrupting the normal functioning of the hippocampus, the normal functioning of which is to help you form long-term memories. If that gets entirely shut down, you're in a blackout. Um, alcohol and other drugs can also affect other structures within this area of the brain, within this area of the central nervous system, again, having influences, whether, whether subtle or profound, on emotions and memory 
and related functions. Elsewhere in the brain, elsewhere in the central nervous system, we find the cortex. Of course, this is the part of the brain that you, you think about probably when you picture the brain in your head. You see the big wrinkly mask, uh, mass of uh, tissue. This, the, cere uh, the cerebral cortex does an awful lot of stuff and um, you know, it's probably, uh, we don't have time and I, like I said, I don't have the energy to go through all of it, but it's worth noting that drugs which influence different parts of the cortex will tend to influence profoundly in some cases patterns of sensation and perception and thought processing. So some simple examples would be things like hallucinogens, which can influence different aspects of the cortex producing often bizarre changes in sensation and perception. Um, more familiar and to, in some extent, to some extent more subtle effects or examples could be a drug like alcohol, which will decrease activity in the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex, among other things, it, um, has functions that are called executive function or executive processing, basically decision making, evaluating options, and, and so on. When drugs shut, like alcohol shut down those functions or impair those functions, we can expect to see emotional and behavioral consequences. So why is it the case that if you've had a bit of alcohol to drink, you're a bit more impulsive? Maybe you walk up to the person you want to flirt with and you start talking to him or talking to her. Or in a, a less pleasant example, maybe you pick a fight with someone or you get in a car and start driving even though that's dangerous to do. Well, in part, it's because alcohol is slowing down and disrupting the normal functioning of your frontal cortex, your frontal lobe of your cerebral cortex, that functioning of which is to help you evaluate options and make good behavioral decisions. So there are a variety of different uh, structures in the nervous system. Here, of course, I'm focusing on the central nervous system and even more specifically on the brain. We could go elsewhere in the body, look at the peripheral nervous system and so on and pick out other examples. If Hopefully this is interesting to you, it's interesting to me, but if you're really interested in it, of course, you can go back and watch some of my previous videos. Um, one thing I do want to highlight, though, is that there's a very particular set of structures within the brain that seem to be particularly important for some aspects of drug use, particularly addiction or dependence. And those structures are all the parts of the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. It's really a collection of different structures that begin kind of in the midbrain or the very top of the hindbrain and extend forward into the forebrain. And these structures are connected to each other um, and all tend to use the neurotransmitter dopamine to communicate to one another. And drugs which activate uh, this system or disrupt this system in a way that makes it more active than it normally is tend to be drugs which are rather addictive. Why is that? Well, because the mesolimbic dopamine pathway is the pathway that's responsible for us identifying and pursuing rewards in our life. So when you are hungry and you see a sign for a restaurant and you think, okay, I'm going to go there and have some lunch. Or when you're attracted to someone and you see him or her walking down the street and you think, oh, okay, I'm going to go over and talk to that person. Um, even you know, when you're tired and you get home to your apartment or your house and you see your couch or your bed and you think, oh, I'm going to go lie down. Even something like that. Those are potential rewards in your environment that you're responding to in terms of your emotions and your behavior and your thinking. Part of that process of responding is mediated by the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. And what's interesting, I mean, that's interesting in and of itself, right? But what's interesting from the perspective of drugs is that drugs which are active on that pathway, which rev it up, tend to be drugs which you can easily form the habit of using. You can form the habit of seeking out that potential reward, i.e. the drug in your life. And at an extreme, you may prefer to seek out that reward than to seek out, you know, food or the company of others or even rest. So instead of having lunch at the restaurant or talking to the person you want to get to know or taking a rest when you're tired, you spend most of your time and effort and energy going after your drug. And that could have deleterious consequences of, on your health. And it could look to other people like you're addicted to that drug. So mesolimbic dopamine pathway, complicated set of structures. They're all interconnected and serve functions like identifying and motivating uh, behavior towards rewards. They're obviously important, or that's those structures are obviously important when we talk about drugs, especially the types of drugs which are addictive or which tend to be relatively addictive.
I'll get back to that point in a couple more slides. But before I get there, I want to show this uh, table, which I know I've shown in other lectures before. It's just a quick rundown of you know six of the most um, commonly uh, studied and well understood neurotransmitters in the brain, um, and with each a, a summary of some of the functions that are associated with that neurotransmitter. And, and to be clear, there's nothing magical about the neurotransmitter itself. It's not like dopamine, the molecule is about pleasure or makes you feel pleasurable. Like if I gave you a glass of water with dopamine mixed into it and asked you to drink it, you wouldn't magically start to feel good. Um, what it is is that dopamine happens to be the, the messenger molecule in parts of the brain that have to do with things like reward. Um, or And serotonin happens to be the messenger molecule in parts of the brain that have to do th with things like sleeping and wakefulness and certain aspects of mood and so on. I think it's important to know uh, these neurotransmitters uh, because I guess it's in, it, that information is interesting in and of itself, but also because it provides a way of generally understanding uh, how some drugs work. So for instance, if I told you I've got this new drug here, it is powerfully dopaminergic, meaning it tends to increase the activity of dopamine uh, using parts of the brain. You might almost immediately think, oh, I bet this drug is probably pretty addictive. Or if I tell you I've got this drug which is cholinergic, it tends to increase activity in parts of the brain that use acetylcholine, you might have some expectations about how that drug would influence the thoughts and feelings and behaviors of users as well. Now, many drugs influence more than one neurotransmitter. In fact, it's relatively rare to find a drug which is very specific to just one neurotransmitter or even just one subtype of neurotransmitter receptor. Um, so to say that a drug is dopaminergic or serotonergic is a little bit of an oversimplification. Nonetheless, I think it's valuable to be familiar with these neurotransmitters yeah, again, just because they're kind of interesting, but also because they give you a way of understanding the general features or contours of many of the drugs that we've talked about. Drugs like uh, alcohol or drugs like cocaine or, or LSD or nicotine or so on. So an important idea here, uh, one that I, I kind of mentioned already, obviously, is that drugs affect thoughts and feelings and behavior depending on how they affect the nervous system. That's not the whole story, but it's a big part of the story. So why does coffee, well, really the caffeine and the coffee, make you feel the way it makes you feel? Why does the nicotine in your cigarette make you feel the way it makes you feel? Why does the LSD that you take make you feel the way you feel if you take LSD? Um, well, a lot of it has to do with how the molecules of that drug are interacting with parts of your nervous system and disrupting the normal functioning of those parts, those structures in your nervous system. And another important idea that I kind of mentioned before as well is that drugs which strongly influence the functioning of the mesolimbic dopamine pathway tend to be addictive, uh, more so than drugs which don't as much. So, you know, a drug like cocaine powerfully activates the mesolimbic dopamine pathway. It's a fairly addictive drug. It's not the case that you are always and instantly addicted to it if you use it. Uh, don't take that as encouragement to use cocaine, but um, but it's a relatively addictive drug as compared to another drug like let's say LSD, which doesn't particularly activate that pathway. It's fairly rare to see people addicted to LSD. It's fairly common to see people addicted to cocaine. Okay, so hopefully you're still with me. I, I know I'm going kind of quickly and obviously I'm summarizing over a very large amount of information, but hopefully this is interesting. Um, so moving on, thinking about drugs, one of the things that's just fascinating to me as someone who's, who's um, you know, worked in research um, with some drugs, with alcohol, who's worked in clinical practice, helping people with drug use problems, and nowadays, at least as I'm recording this stuff, mostly teaches in the area of drugs, um, is how variable drug uh, effects are. Um, so though, although it's generally the case that a drug like cocaine will make you feel energetic, and uh, you know, sort of have strong positive emotions. And it's generally the case 
that a drug like Quaaludes will make you feel very relaxed. It's also the case that those effects are quite variable either across people, so not everyone who gets the same dose of a drug is going to have exactly the same feelings, but they're also quite variable within people. So if you took the same drug on repeated occasions, you wouldn't have exactly the same experience every single time you took it. Um, now this is, may seem like an obvious point, but I think it's again kind of fascinating, and it's one that kind of rings true to me. If you think about a drug like alcohol, some of you have used alcohol quite a lot. You probably have many instances in your life where you've drunk alcohol, and assuming you drink about the same amount of alcohol each time you drink, I mean, there's probably some variability in that, but you think about having a few drinks worth of alcohol on one occasion, and a few drinks worth of alcohol on another occasion, if you think about it, you probably got slightly different experiences out of those drinking sessions. Or a drug like caffeine, you know, sometimes when you drink caffeine, it makes you feel a particular way, you feel sort of pleasantly energetic. Other times when you drink caffeine, it makes you feel kind of anxious and irritable. Same drug may be used in roughly the same dose, different experiences. So the experiences or the effects of drug use are quite variable across people and even within each individual person over time. How do we explain that? How do we explain that variability or understand what influences that variability? Well, there are a variety of different uh, answers to that question. One answer focuses on the drugs themselves. So drug effects depend at least in part on well, the drug, you know, how pure it is. So if you if you have a, a very um, a very adulterated dose of cocaine on one occasion, you know, most of what you're sniffing is, is actually not cocaine itself, it's other stuff like baking soda or talcum powder or crushed up aspirin. And then on a different occasion you have a very pure dose of cocaine, then on, you wouldn't be at all surprised if you knew that the second dose was more pure to have a much stronger experience. Or you know, if you have a, a rather weak cup of coffee on one day and then the next day you have a really strong cup of coffee you know, no surprise, the second experience is going to be more, um, well, it's going to be stronger. You're going to feel more energetic, more uh, alert. So the purity of a drug plays some role in the variability of experiences that people have, either between each other or within themselves across time. The method of administration has an effect as well. So, you know, an example that I think I've given in my lectures before is, in my own life, the difference between smoking cigars and smoking cigarettes, two things I thankfully don't do anymore. But back in the 90s, when it was sort of fashionable to do this, I used to sometimes smoke cigars when I was out drinking, back when you could smoke and drink at a bar probably a good thing that you can't do that anymore. And when I smoked cigars, I would, like most people who smoke cigars, only mouth the smoke, bring the smoke into my mouth and then blow it out. Not, for the most part, inhaling it into my lungs. Later on, I picked up the habit of smoking cigarettes and like most cigarette smokers, I inhaled the smoke down into my lungs. You can absorb nicotine far more efficiently through your lungs than you can through your mouth. And I found that I was never really addicted to cigars. I sort of thought they were fashionable something I, I don't think is so fashionable anymore, but at the time it seemed like a cool thing to do. Um, but I never really got addicted to smoking cigars or addicted to nicotine from smoking cigars. But I've got very quickly addicted to nicotine from smoking cigarettes because the route of administration or the method of administration was far more efficient for that drug uh, when I smoked cigarettes than when I smoked cigars. So part of what explains that variability is the purity of the drug, the method of administration. Part of what explains the variability are that people are different. So if we say, well, different people get different experiences from using a drug, well, that shouldn't really surprise us because people differ from one another in a lot of meaningful ways. Uh, they have biological differences, you know, many of which are genetic, which makes some people more susceptible to the rewarding experiences of, cer of certain types of drugs. You know, some people are, are much more uh, genetically likely to get addicted to nicotine than others. Some people are much more genetically likely to get addicted to alcohol than others. And those genetic factors play a role in the experiences people have when they drink alcohol and when they smoke cigarettes or when they use other drugs. 
Um, you know, like I said, I used to smoke cigarettes. I got addicted to them, but it wasn't that hard for me to quit. Um, I didn't have much of a risk, I don't think, biologically, to become addicted to cigarettes. Uh, I have other friends and, and colleagues and people I know who were very addicted to cigarettes for very long periods of time and had a lot of difficulty quitting. It's likely that those people carried a much higher genetic risk for becoming addicted to nicotine. Um, yeah, another example in my own life is, you know, I have a family history of alcoholism in my family. When I drink alcohol, I think it has a much more rewarding effect on me than it does on many people I know. And thus, I haven't really struggled with it in my life, but there's certainly been times when it's easier, I think, for me to drink too much than it is for many of the people I know. And I have to work at controlling that probably a little bit harder than other people I'm friends with or I'm familiar with. So biological differences make one person more likely to respond to a drug than another and account in some extent, to some extent, for that variability in effects. Differences in experiences and expectations people hold also seem to play a role in this as well. People who have the mindset or the expectation that a drug will be particularly rewarding are more likely to have that rewarding experience than people who have the mindset or the expectation that that same drug will not be particularly rewarding. So again, when we try and explain why is it the case that some people can have a really strong or pleasant or rewarding experience from a drug, other people not so much, some of it may be due to psychological differences between people. So a third factor, or really broad set of factors, are all those things which comprise the setting in which drugs are used. Drugs which are used in rather pleasant or, or comforting settings tend to be much more pleasant or comforting than drugs which are used in chaotic or unpleasant settings. Uh, when we talked about hallucinogens, I think I made the point that you know, a hallucinogen like LSD can have profoundly different um, effects on people as a function of where it's used. So somebody using LSD out in a sort of a pleasant, relaxing, pastoral setting with the company of some supportive friends might have a very pleasant trip, a pleasant experience from that drug. That same person using that same drug and that same dose in a crowded dance club full of flashing lights and lasers and thumping music might have a very different experience. It might be much more threatening or disorienting because the setting is different. A more familiar example for many people, assuming that most of you don't regularly use LSD, is alcohol. You know, if you drink alcohol uh, with your friends in a pleasant setting, you're having dinner at someone's house and you're splitting a bottle of wine or, or you're you know, having beers at a bar after work and it's a relaxing setting, you're talking. For many people, that's going to be a very pleasant experience. Your mood is going to be elevated and you'll probably feel sort of relaxed and happy about your life. If you have that same drug, alcohol, in roughly the same dose by yourself in a, in a setting with no friends, no fun, nothing pleasant going on, you might feel sort of tired from it or maybe even a little bit morose or depressed. You know, why is that different? What's changed? Well, the dose of drug, let's assume, is about the same. You're about the same, uh, but you're drinking, you're using the drug in a different setting, one which doesn't have those pleasant features which would otherwise modify the experience for you. So the drug, the person, the setting in which they're used, the drug is used, all these factors or sets of factors help us explain how variable the experience of drug use can be, either across people, one person to another to another, or even within people, like one person to himself or herself across different time points. To put that all a little bit more simply, you know, drugs can have different effects. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good, obviously. Why is that? Well, it has to do with differences between the dosing and purity of the drug, differences between people in terms of their biology or in the psychology, and differences between the setting in which the drug is used. A couple important ideas to take away from this. One important idea is that some types of drug or drug use are riskier than others. In general, uh, if you're using a drug that's very pure, or if you're using a drug in a way that allows for a very fast administration, a very fi efficient absorption of the drug, you face greater risks, both for having acute problems like overdose or long-term problems like addiction. That's not always true, but in general, if you compare two forms of drug use, 
um, as a function of their purity or their administration, you'll see that the one which is more pure can be the riskier. You know, a simple example of this might be something, well, I guess I've already used the example of nicotine uh, from cigarettes. Uh, another familiar uh, example that we've talked about is the difference between snorting or, or sniffing uh, heroin versus injecting it. Um, you're much more likely to overdose on heroin if you inject it. You're also much more likely to become addicted to it if you inject it because um, you can have a much quicker administration, a much more efficient absorption from that method of, uh, of administration than from, the in, than from nasal inhalation or from sniffing. So again, some drugs which are very pure, which can be administered very quickly, are riskier than drugs which are less pure and can be are less efficiently or, or more slowly uh, administered. Another important idea is that some people are going to just be at greater risk for drug problems than others. And I already kind of touched upon this, so I'll just briefly repeat myself. Um, <clears throat> there are some people who, as a function of their genetics or other biological factors uh, may be at greater risk to have problems associated with drug use, either acute problems like toxicity or long-term problems, chronic problems like dependence. Um, that, the, that can be due to biological differences, it can be due to psychological differences. So not every drug user is the same. We're all different from one another and some of those differences can play into the relative risk for having drug problems. Um, when we compare one person to another person to another person. And kind of a third important idea is when we think about the settings in which drug use, drugs are used, there are some settings or, or patterns of drug use that are riskier than others. When we use drugs in settings or environments that encourage heavy or rapid use of drugs, those are going to convey greater risk for both acute and chronic problems. When we use drugs in settings or in, in patterns uh, that involve combining drugs, that's usually a riskier, uh, you know, that's a riskier way to do drugs than, than uh, settings or patterns of use that don't encourage combinations of drugs. Um, and finally, when we use drugs uh, and combine them with behaviors that are already risky, like for instance driving a car, well, surprising or unsurprisingly I should say, that makes things riskier still. The point is here that um, if we think about drugs and we think maybe particularly about the risks associated with drugs, we have to consider both um, the drug itself, like I said, the, the individual differences between drug users and the differences between the settings in which drugs are used. And, and clearly, um, you know, there are many settings in which drugs like alcohol are used in frankly unsafe ways. You know, it's, it's fun to go to a party, it's, it's great to go to an exciting bar, but if you go to a setting in which heavy alcohol use is encouraged or the combination of alcohol and other drugs is encouraged or the combination of alcohol and other behaviors like uh, driving a car is encouraged or at least tolerated, we shouldn't be surprised that the risks associated with that drug, alcohol, increase relative to using that same drug in other settings that don't have those same imperatives or, or pressures associated with it. Um, to summarize this all into yet another uh, variation of this important idea, it's that the effects and the risks of drugs are variable. I mean, that's kind of obvious, but I think it's worth mentioning and repeating. Um, and the important part here is to recognize that understanding that variability is really important if we want to maximize some of the benefits we get for drugs and minimize some of the risks we have when we use drugs. There's no drug that's entirely good and there's no drug that's entirely bad, at least in my judgment. Um, what drug use is about is about trying to be intelligent and thoughtful and planful about drug use so that you get most of the benefits and you run few, as few as possible of the risks. Again, drugs like alcohol, which can be a horrible drug. Alcohol is an incredibly dangerous drug in many, many ways. It can be very toxic to your body, uh, both in terms of acute toxicity and chronic toxicity. Uh, it can be very dangerous in terms of its risk for addiction. It can be very dangerous in terms of the social problems associated with it. Alcohol is a bad drug, but it's also a good drug. It can be used responsibly by some people in some ways that, uh, such that it enhances life. It makes the good times better, whether it's sharing a glass of wine with a loved one, relaxing with a friend, you know, at a bar after work, those type of things. Um, 
Harm reduction is this idea that we use when we think about that balance. We're kind of optimizing that balance so we get the most of the benefits and we run the fewest of the risks. And in order to do that, I think as individuals, it's worth understanding some things about the various factors that play into the variability of drug effects. And that's a point that I've tried to make throughout the semester and hopefully it's, it's come through clearly to you guys. Okay, so moving on a little bit more. Um, thinking about drugs, you know, if you enrolled in this class, um, you probably did it because you're interested in drugs. You probably did it because you're interested in maybe treating drug problems, or you're curious about addiction or dependence. Um, you don't need me to say it, but clearly drugs can be addictive. At least some drugs can be addictive for some people. And to think about this problem, we can ask the simple question, or maybe the not so simple question, why do people start using drugs? Well, as I've noted before, and as I've tried to note throughout the whole semester, there are biological factors that seem to play a role in the initiation of drug use. Some people uh, have genetic risks that make it more likely that they will pick up the habit of drug use. Um, we don't know as much about the specific genes that play a role in addiction for different types of drugs like alcohol, nicotine, and so on. Um, but there's a lot of research in this area and a lot of promise that we will uncover the genes or groups of genes which convey some of that risk. But it's clearly the case that uh, the susceptibility to drug use and to drug use problems like addiction, dependence, is at least in part genetic. And maybe also has to do with other biological factors like interuterine exposure to drugs. You know, if you are exposed to drugs because your mother is using them while she is pregnant with you, that can increase the risk for beginning drug use and starting to have problems with drug use. We also know that drug use, uh, people start using drugs and people can start having problems with drugs because of psychological factors. People who have personality uh, features or personality traits of high sensation seeking, who tend to be drawn to excitement or to risky behaviors in general, are often going to be more drawn to drug use than are people who don't have those uh, same personality traits. So if you take two people, one of whom is kind of a risk taker by nature, compare him or compare her to another person who's much more cautious or, or, or sort of slow moving and shy in his life or her life, it wouldn't surprise you that the sensation seeker, the risk takers, could be more likely to initiate drug use, maybe even initiate risky drug use, and maybe over time more likely to become addicted or dependent on drugs. As I noted before, other psychological factors include things like expectations and motivations for using. If you're the type of person who generally sees drugs as a positive thing, you, you know, most of your associations that you have, if I was to kind of ask you just to describe drugs, describe what you think about them, and if most of the stuff you said was, well, you know, they're sort of positive, they're fun, they help you relax, they can help you get to know people, if those, if you're the type of person who holds those expectations, who has those kind of motives for use, you're going to be more likely to use drugs than someone who doesn't have those positive associations. I noted way back early in the semester that among college students, you know, I'm a college professor, so I'm around college students a lot, um, it's commonly held that alcohol, particularly as a drug, is a big part of socializing. Uh, that's an expectation that many, not all, but many college students have. And it seems that those who have that expectation, perhaps this is no great surprise, are more likely to use alcohol and they're more likely to use it in social settings than are uh, students who don't have that expectation, who don't hold those attitudes or beliefs. And that's important because, you know, it is true to say that alcohol can help you to socialize, but it's also true to say that alcohol is involved in all sorts of social problems on college campuses and elsewhere. So, uh, you know, why is it that some people start using drugs? Why is it some people can become, uh, a, you know, addicted to drugs? Some of it is biological. Some of it, as I'm trying to summarize briefly here on this uh, um, page or this slide, is psychological. Moreover, there are social factors that influence uh, addiction or influence drug use and inf influence the risk for drug use problems like addiction or dependence. Um, those include peer groups. Um, peer groups, of course, provide access to drug use. Um, you know, if you hang out with friends who, if, if you are underage for drinking alcohol, but you have older friends, you, they can give you access to alcohol. If you 
uh, hang out with people who use marijuana or who use cocaine, you have more easy access to that drug. Peer groups also provide important norms or guidelines, and these are, can often be rather subtle or even implicit about what's acceptable to do with drugs. You know, if your friends are heavy drinkers, it's easier for you to become a heavy drinker. If your friends don't drink, it's easier for you to maintain abstinence, assuming that that's something you want to do. Uh, if your friends smoke cigarettes, it's easier for you to pick up the habit of smoking cigarettes. I know I've used the example of my own experience of smoking a number of times over the semester, but I think a big part of the reason I began smoking was I had friends and for a while was dating someone who was also a smoker. So, you know, hanging out with them, hanging out with her, it was easy to start smoking, just as something to do to pass the time when we were socializing. In some ways, looking back on those experiences, it's clear to me that the social groups I had played a role in my use of that drug, nicotine in the form of tobacco, uh, in cigarettes, I should say, um, even though at the time I wasn't really thinking about it that way. I wasn't thinking, gosh, you know, my friends smoke and they're encouraging me to smoke, therefore I should smoke. It just kind of happened or it seemed to happen to me. And I don't think I'm that unusual. I think many people could probably find similar examples in their own lives. So an important idea to take away from this is that there are different factors that, that can lead people to use drugs or even to become eventually addicted to or dependent on drugs. It's not just as simple as either choosing to use drugs or choosing to not use drugs. And I don't mean to particularly pick on the former first lady Nancy Reagan here, but uh, her rather famous or infamous Just Say No campaign in the 1980s was something that I grew up with. This was part of my education. You know, I was told not to use drugs. I was told to just say no by parents and teachers and Boy Scout uh, leaders and so on. Um, in retrospect, I think most of these people, probably all of these people, had the best of intentions, uh, but I think they presented a very simplistic picture of drug use, where people just decide to use drugs or they decide to not use drugs. It's more complicated than that. Now, to be clear, drug use involves choices. You know, people are choosing to use drugs. It's just that those choices aren't the same for all people. You know, like the, the, the decision to use or not use a drug like, say, nicotine is, you know, maybe a little easier for me to make than someone who has a genetic risk to become addicted to nicotine. The decision to use or not use alcohol is different for someone who has friends who are all heavy drinkers than it is for someone who has friends who don't drink very much. The decision to use or, or not use a drug like marijuana is different for someone who generally holds the belief that marijuana is a fairly benign drug as compared to someone who holds the belief that marijuana is a fairly dangerous drug. We're not all the same. We're, we're quite different from one another and even we're different from ourselves over time. And so those particular decisions about using or not using uh, are not as easy as they sometimes appear or as they sometimes are made out to be. And that's, I think, a kind of an important lesson or an important idea that I hope you've learned and, and taken away from this semester. So we kind of asked the question, why do people start using drugs or why do people drift into, um, you know, drift closer and closer to addiction or dependence. We can also kind of ask another related question, which is why do some people have a hard time stopping drug use? Why do some people frankly become addicted or become dependent on drugs? Now addiction or dependence is a complicated phenomenon and involves many of the factors that I've already identified, the biological, psychological, and social factors that I've already identified. In terms of talking about dependence, uh, talking about addiction throughout the semester, I've focused a lot on psychological factors, particularly on simple features of behavioral uh, of behaviorism, of operant conditioning, particularly patterns of reinforcement. Positive reinforcement involves drug use that leads to good feelings. So we um, we sometimes, or at least historically, used to call this psychological addiction. If you're using a drug because you uh, it leads to pleasant, rewarding sensations, uh, you're more likely to continue using that drug. Much as any animal who uh, engages in a behavior which yields a reward will be more likely to engage in that behavior subsequently. Um, so if your use of alcohol, your use of cocaine, your use of marijuana is because it makes you feel good, over time as you pursue that feeling again and again, more and more, and it's reinforced once uh, again and again and again, you can start to have what used to be called psychological addiction. Uh, that 
that term, as I've said previously, is kind of uh, anachronistic and a little bit uh, incorrect because it doesn't just have to do with positive psychological feelings. It can also have to do with physical sensations that are pleasant that occur when you use a drug. Um, I mentioned operant conditioning, that is, uh, you know, changes in behavior that occur as a consequence of reinforcement. I also should mention here that as you are positively reinforced for using a drug, your body, your mind, develops associations between that drug and a variety of stimuli in the environment which accompany that drug. And these stimuli over time can elicit the desire the craving for positive feelings. So it's a pretty common phenomenon when you talk to people who use drugs uh, that they will describe things in their environment which trigger a feeling of craving for them to use. Um, the example that I've given in this semester is when I stopped uh, using cigarettes, so I quit, I found that for a very long time afterwards, even up through today, I'll occasionally pass a cue associated with cigarette. Like uh, I have a cigarette lighter at home that I use to light candles. Uh, every time I pick it up, I sort of have a vague urge to smoke a cigarette. Sometimes I'll hold my pen or pencil in a manner similar to that which I used to hold my cigarette, and I'll have this momentary craving like, oh, I really like a cigarette. Why is that? It's because those things, that cigarette lighter, that way of holding a stick-like object in your fingers, um, remind me of the feelings I had when I used to smoke. And even though it's been many years since I last smoked a cigarette and I don't particularly want to anymore, there's part of me that in a sense remembers that, that responds to that potential reward the way it used to, the way I used to, the way my body used to. So positive reinforcement is a is an idea in psychology uh, that is you know has been well studied throughout the century the last century or so. Um, it's something that I think plays a big role in why for some people it's hard to stop using drugs because they they enjoy the positive feelings they've had from using drugs and they maybe have many cues in their environment which trigger craving for those same positive feelings. Now, another phenomenon that describes or helps to explain why people, at least some people, have difficulty stopping the use of drugs is negative reinforcement. Negative reinforcement occurs when use of a drug takes away a bad feeling. And it's a phenomenon that, again, has been studied much in psychology for a very long time. Any animal that engages in a behavior which decreases a punishment will be more likely to engage in that behavior again. So if you uh, engage in a behavior like smoking a cigarette and it makes you feel relaxed, it's taking away an unpleasant feeling of not being relaxed, of feeling kind of edgy and uncomfortable. If you are a person who drinks uh, a drink of alcohol and it makes you feel more sort of loose and lively in a party, maybe it's taking away some of the anxiety that you're previously feeling. Those, uh, those, uh, that, that taking away, that withdrawing of a punishment is in a sense a reward, um, but we call it negative reinforcement. And we used to refer to this, the, what occurs from this as physical addiction. So you look at someone who's uh, you know, a heavy user of opiates, they'll often describe that they continue using uh, opiates because they don't want to get sick when they go into withdrawal from stopping. Or, um, you know, again, to talk once more about my own use of cigarettes, there's a long period of time when I was quitting when for a while I kind of kept up the habit. I wasn't really committed to quitting in part because I just wanted to um, not feel kind of cranky when I stopped using cigarettes. So I had that kind of sense of like, oh, I don't want to feel crummy when I stop, so I'm not going to quit today. That was because negative reinforcement was keeping me going in my habit of using cigarettes. We used to refer to this as physical addiction because many people who are addicted to drugs will describe not wanting to get sick or not wanting to feel un, you know, physically unpleasant from withdrawal, but it doesn't have to be physical. So that term is a little bit incorrect or a little bit uh, kind of a, probably should be retired. You know, you can want to continue using drugs because you don't want to feel sad or anxious when you stop. Uh, that's still negative reinforcement. You're still using to avoid a bad thing, avoid a punishment. And much as was the case with positive reinforcement, when we look at negative reinforcement, um, if you use drugs for long enough, your environment is, uh, you know, will, will, will include stimuli associated with um, the use of that drug, which can trigger your desire for negative reinforcement. So uh, if you're someone who spends many years of your life 
uh, drinking alcohol when you feel stressed out, like, oh, you know, it's been a hard day, I'm going to go to the bar and have a drink. Over time, stress itself can become a cue for negative reinforcement from alcohol use. So later on in your life, perhaps you decide to become abstinent from drinking, you, you entirely quit, or even you just drink less frequently than you used to. Uh, but stress still happens in your life, in your job, in your family. The feeling of stress may make you think, oh God, I really want to drink. That's because that stress is a cue. It's an internal cue, which triggers a feeling of, of wanting that negative reinforcement, wanting to take away that bad feeling, the stress itself, by doing a behavior, drinking alcohol. And at an extreme, this negative reinforcement can play a powerful role in maintaining drug use, that is, keeping people using, keeping people dependent or addicted to drugs. An important idea here is that many people begin using drugs for reasons of positive reinforcement. They initially start, you know, uh, using marijuana or using alcohol or using nicotine because it feels good or is in some way rewarding to them. But they continue using it often for negative reinforcement because it's hard to stop. Yeah, you know, that's a pretty common picture that you will you will see or a description or story you will hear if you talk to someone who's a heavy and long time user of marijuana or long time user of cocaine or long time user of nicotine or even or alcohol. You know, people who are heavy smokers or have been smoking for a long time will say, yeah, you know, when I first started smoking, I liked how it made me feel. Nowadays, I don't really like how it makes me feel. I just keep smoking because when I don't smoke, I feel really crummy. That's a kind of an example of that interplay over time or that shifting over time between positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. And because of this, not, not only because of uh, these these phenomena or these factors, cutting down and stopping is hard and relapse is really common. People typically have a hard time stopping their drug use in almost every case. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an unfortunate and frustrating feature of, uh, of drug dependence, of drug addiction, that people who are addicted try to stop and maybe want to stop but still struggle to do so. It's also worth noting here that people are generally more sensitive to short-term rewards, to that short-term feeling good, <clears throat> and they're more sensitive to short-term removal of punishment, like feeling less bad, than they are to long-term punishments associated with drug use. So you know, you may, when you start you know using, uh, let's say using uh, nicotine, you know, to once again use the smoking example, the short-term reward of feeling good when you smoke, or even the short-term reward of feeling less bad, you know, feeling less anxious when you smoke, is much more salient, much more uh, right in front of you than are the potential long-term punishments associated with using that drug, like increased risk for cancer, increased risk for emphysema, and so on. And that's not, if you're that person, and many people are like this, you're, you're not alone. That's the way humans tend to be, and that's the way most animals are. We're much more aware of short term than we are of long term. It's harder to think in concrete ways about the long term. So again, that makes cutting down and stopping hard. When you talk to people who are using drugs and who are maybe even addicted to drugs, you can talk to them about the risks, like, oh gosh, if you keep on doing this, you'll you'll get cancer and die, or if you keep on doing this, you'll get really sick, or if you keep on doing this, you won't enjoy life as much as you otherwise would. The person who you're talking to may well agree with you. They may not be arguing with it, but it's still the case that those short-term rewards, those short-term removals of punishment are just much more salient, much more obvious to them than any of this abstract long-term stuff that you're talking about. So maybe the last topic that I want to touch on in this thinking about drugs review of the semester is the treatment of drug use problems. Many people who enroll for this class, or probably many people who just watch some of my videos on YouTube, are interested in treatment for drug use problems because uh, they want to go into a career in uh, substance abuse counseling or because they know people who have drug use problems. Um, and one of the themes I've tried to hit throughout the semester is that drug use problems, like drug use more generally, it's complicated, and treatments can be complicated as well. One of the complications or one of the challenges in treatment for drug use disorders is our understanding that recovery, that is shifting from a period of relatively uncontrolled drug use to a period of more controlled or even abstinence drug use, is a long process and that setbacks, including relapses into use, are pretty common. 
Um, one of the uh, things I've talked about in more recent lectures is the stages of change model, which was originally developed uh, for use in studying people who are trying to make a shift from drug use to recovery. Um, and this model suggests that, that that shift occurs through different stages and that relapse or, or sort of setbacks are common. We can kind of cycle backwards and have to continue the process repeatedly. Now that's tremendously frustrating for the people who are experiencing those setbacks or are experiencing those relapses, but it can be important to recognize because at least if we do, we are less likely, I hope, or I think, to blame people or, uh, for their relapses or, or assume that a relapse means that treatment is a failure or that recovery is not possible. Um, rather, recovery is possible for, for most people, probably for all people with drug use problems, but the process to getting there or the process to getting there and indeed maintaining recovery, it's a long-term process and it can be a complex process. I highlighted some of the basic um, elements of motivational interviewing in my lecture on treatment because motivational interviewing is a type of therapeutic technique which, like the stages of change model, was developed in the context of substance abuse treatment. And motivational interviewing is often not used entirely on its own. Uh, it's often used in connection with other forms of treatment, including other forms of psychological treatment or forms of pharmacological treatment for drug use problems. But the key or the value for motivational interviewing is that it can help people persist in treatment. It can help people cope with those relapses and those setbacks so that they can maintain progress in their stages of, of change, maintain progress in their, um, in their goal towards uh, getting and maintaining recovery. In some of my previous lectures, I highlighted this rather uh, sort of fussy flow chart from one of the textbooks that I used to use that describes um, the process by which someone can go from recognizing a problem to maintaining a change or indeed even relapsing and having to repeat. It's not vitally important that you memorize this flow chart. The reason why I included it is it just highlights some of the different paths where you can get from the right uh, the left part of the screen where you're just beginning to recognize that you have a problem, you're just beginning the early stages of change, over to the more rightward side of the screen where you're uh, maintaining an outcome of recovery or perhaps relapsing. And the three basic pathways to get there involve um, changing, or in this case it's written quitting on your own. There are some people who make changes or progress through those stages of change on their own. There's also a path that involves using only self-help groups in the community. And there's also a path which involves some combination of professional treatments. Now, for different people uh, in different situations, different pathways are going to be better or worse. Uh, for much of my lectures, I focused on the professional treatment path because it's the one that receives the most attention, of course, from professionals, from clinicians and scientists who work with folks who have substance use disorders, who have drug use problems. Problems. Folks who work in this area, professionals, clinicians, and scientists, recognize that there are different factors that contribute to drug use. Many of these, of course, I've already described in this little review lecture. There are biological uh, factors involved in drug use problems, there are psychological factors involved in drug use problems, and there are social and setting factors involved in drug use problems. The best treatments that we have, at least in terms of the best professional treatments we have, are those which try to target or try to work with each of these factors, or really each of these sets of factors. So if you are going in for professional treatment for a drug use problem, you may uh, benefit from getting some sort of a biological intervention, typically some kind of pharmacology or drug treatment where you're uh, given uh, some medications to help you manage symptoms of withdrawal so that you're less likely to relapse as a function of negative reinforcement. You're hopefully going to be given some psychological treatments that help you deal with craving, identify cues that can trigger relapse. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a good example of a form of psychological treatment which is often used with folks who have um, substance use disorders. And hopefully you're also getting some social support. You might uh, be referred to a support group at the clinic where you're getting your 
cognitive behavioral therapy, or you might be recommended to join a recovery group like Smart Recovery or Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous to provide some of that community and peer support, which can be helpful to maintaining abstinence or to maintaining some other non-abstinent type of recovery. There's, there's a lot of complexity here, but the important idea or the important, important point that I want to make is that substance use uh, disorders are hard to treat um, and that treatment can be a complex and ongoing process that can involve different types of elements. Again, medications, psychological therapies, and community support. It's, it's understandable, but it's a bit naive to think that just one of those things alone is going to be helpful for most people. So just sending someone to a detox program where they provide, they're provide they provided with medical support as they withdraw, um, that can be a good start, but in and of itself is probably not for most people going to be a sufficient amount of treatment to help someone get to and maintain recovery. Or just sending someone to a community support group. That, that may work for some people, but it's probably not the best call. It's ideally going to work uh, best for most people to have some kind of biological or medical intervention, some sort of psychological intervention, and some sort of community or social intervention as well. As a really general idea across all the different topics that we've covered in these lectures, I've just tried to stress diversity and, and complexity. Uh, drugs are complicated. Drug use behaviors are complicated. And for all sorts of reasons, many of them well-intentioned reasons, we sometimes try to oversimplify that complexity. We try and act like certain drugs are good and certain drugs are bad, or certain types of drug use are safe and other types are dangerous, or certain types of therapy work and other types just don't work. Um, if we look closely, if we're thoughtful, we almost always see diversity and complexity. And we should remember that advice to make things as simple as possible, but not simpler, not oversimplifying that complexity, rather trying to learn and work with that complexity. And with that in mind, I'd like to say thank you for your attention for this semester. Um, I hope you've enjoyed these videos. If you're enrolled in my class, I hope you've learned from them. Uh, if you're not enrolled in my class, I hope you've enjoyed them and learned from them as well. Uh, I do my best to respond to comments and questions that people put on YouTube. Um, I'm pretty busy, but, but I get little notifications when people like or, or, or question my videos. I try to respond to them. So if you have questions, post them on YouTube and I'll do my best to answer. I'll try to add more content in the coming semesters as I tweak and update and supplement this playlist. Uh, but until then, um, thanks again. I really appreciate your attention. Hopefully you can take a little break, have a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, and let all of this good information sink in. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.